Plain and simple, I-bonds protect cash from inflation, thereby preserving your purchasing power. They can make a great addition for anyone with spare cash that they won't need for at least a year. Both young investors and retirees get what is essentially an inflation-adjusted emergency fund that is highly liquid and virtually risk-free. Inflation is always happening, hopefully at a steady rate, kept on the rails by a central bank. This expected inflation is already incorporated into asset prices. What we're concerned with possibly protecting protecting against is unexpected above average inflation. Even then, an investor with a long time horizon and a high tolerance for risk and subsequently a high allocation to stocks likely shouldn't be worried about short-term inflation. However, it's perfectly suitable and even desirable for retirees, risk-averse investors, and those with a short time horizon to have some allocation to inflation-protected assets like tips. The only appropriate scenario I can see for buying these types of funds is if the investor, for some reason, consciously wants to implement a rolling covered call strategy without handling the logistics of writing the options themselves in order to generate regular income from the option writing that they need every month. Let me put this very simply and straightforwardly. If you do not need that regular income every single month to pay for your expenses, there is no reason to buy funds like these. More generally, I'd even say if you are reinvesting its dividends, there is no reason for you to buy funds like these. But if income is the concern, I'd say just go with CEFs, or again, a combination of dividend stocks and high yield bonds. Income is overrated anyway. I'd be more likely to go with something like SWAN or SPD and just set up an automatic monthly transfer from the brokerage account that sells shares for me. There's my income. In the interest of full disclosure, I'm not a dividend investor anyway, and I'd rather just sell shares as needed. So these types of yield focused strategies don't appeal to me regardless. I'd rather create my own dividend when I want to. There's no free lunch outside of diversification. If you are reducing risk with expensive option hedging strategies, you are by definition also accepting lower expected returns. But as we've seen, QILD doesn't even do a good job of that. Again, covered calls are simply not an efficient way to de-risk a portfolio. In fairness, with bonds entering a headwind and stock valuations at all-time highs, option strategies may indeed prove fruitful going forward for some unknown time period for the income investor with a short time horizon. But I'd still submit that it's highly unlikely that we'd see a flat market over the long term. At global market weights, US stocks only comprise about half of the global market. International stocks don't move in perfect lockstep with US stocks offering a diversification benefit. If U.S. stocks are declining, international stocks may be doing well, and vice versa. The U.S. is one single country. No single country consistently outperforms all the others in the world. If one did, that outperformance would also lead to relative overvaluation and a subsequent reversal. The legendary Meb Faber found that if you look at the past 70 years, the U.S. stock market has outperformed foreign stocks by 1% per year, but all of that outperformance has come after 2009. During the period 1970 to 2008, for example, an equity portfolio of 80% US stocks and 20% international stocks had higher general and risk-adjusted returns than a 100% US stock portfolio. In short, geographic diversification in equities has huge potential upside and little downside for investors. But should you invest in commodities? Probably not. Again, commodities are physical assets like gold, oil, copper, livestock, coffee, agriculture, etc. Their value depends on their usage in production and is directly related to supply and demand. Any position in commodities is therefore a speculative bet on the short-term future rather than long-term growth associated with things like stocks, bonds, real estate, etc. As such, investors have historically turned to commodities as a hedge against uncertainty, but they don't even do a great job of that. Unfortunately, commodities themselves are unpredictable by their very nature. Crops go bad, the weather changes, macroeconomic policies shift, alternatives to things like copper are found, ownership, storage, and transportation of commodities increase costs. Stock ownership is a claim on a company's future earnings. A bond is a contractual obligation between a lender and a borrower, with interest payments going from the latter to the former. Ownership of a commodity is not value producing. It involves no earnings 
or cash flow and is simply a bet on production and or consumption at that time. A ton of copper will still be a ton of copper 10 years from now, and it pays no dividends or interest. Commodities are obviously useful to your everyday life, but not so much as an investment in securities markets. Cash flow drives returns. Think of owning a commodities fund as just paying for their storage somewhere. With technological advances, we would expect commodity prices to fall or stay flat over the long term. If a particular commodity remains expensive, cheaper alternatives will be found. If wheat prices rise, farmers will just plant more wheat next season. So supply rises and the price falls back to where it was. This supply and demand cycle can sometimes take years to complete, but over the long term, we would again expect commodity prices to remain flat. After fees, commodities funds are typically pretty pricey, commodities are likely losing to inflation. And indeed they have historically. Commodities have had negative real returns over the last 100 years. Here's another pretty staggering stat. At the time of this video, commodities are simultaneously up 31% year to date, yet still have a negative 10 year return. Essentially, even in inflationary environments, investors have historically been better off over the long term, holding just about anything other than commodities. And we now have assets like REITs, TIPS, etc. as alternatives. Even a narrow gold fund should be a better choice than broad commodities. Commodities may offer a tiny diversification benefit to lower volatility and risk, but we still want our diversifiers to have positive future expected returns. Moreover, commodities tend to become much more correlated with stocks at precisely the time we want to rely on them, during stock crashes. Andrew Tobias, in the only investment guide you'll ever need, maintains that it is a fact that 90% of all people who play the commodities game get burned. I submit that you have now read all you ever need to read about commodities. The legendary Ken French maintains a similar position. The claim that, going forward, commodity funds will have the same sharp ratio as the stock market will be negatively correlated with the returns on stocks and bonds and will be a good hedge against inflation can't all be true. Who would want the other side of this trade? The high volatility of commodity prices makes it impossible to accurately estimate the expected returns, volatilities, and covariances of commodity funds. But theory suggests that if commodity returns are negatively correlated with the rest of the market, the expected risk premium on commodities is small, perhaps negative. Finally, commodity funds are poor inflation hedges. Most of the variation in commodity prices is unrelated to inflation. In fact, commodity indices are typically 10 to 15 times more volatile than inflation. As a result, investors who use commodity funds to hedge inflation almost certainly increase the risk of their portfolios. So market timers try to get the best price by predicting market behavior so that they can buy low and sell high. Sounds great, right? What's wrong with that? Unfortunately, just like with stock picking versus passive indexing, the evidence overwhelmingly suggests that successfully timing the market is all but impossible, for the simple reason that market movement is essentially random and unpredictable, as all available information is already priced in. All crystal balls are cloudy, and one cannot expect to accurately and consistently time the market. In fact, the practice is usually more harmful than helpful. Studies suggest that time in the market is the way to go. That is, as I've said elsewhere, invest early, hold for the long term, and ignore the short term noise. Stay the course, as Jack Bogle said. In doing so, we're relying on the simple premise that the market tends to go up more than it goes down, so we don't need to try to time its movement. As long as the fundamental reasons for investing in the first place haven't changed, the time in the market investor simply keeps buying regularly, regardless of market sentiment or valuations. Moreover, the market spends a non-trivial amount of time at all-time highs, which are usually not followed by major dips, so there's no logical reason to sit on cash in fear of a crash, just because the market is looking good. In doing so, market timers usually simply miss out on those gains on the way back up. The common saying now is that time in the market beats timing the market. While we have loads of evidence illustrating the futility of active management and market timing, their allure persists, largely due to behavioral biases. Ironically, the market timer is likely to continue trying to time the market due to hindsight bias, for example, which means humans tend to remember their past predictions as more accurate than they really were. Loss aversion plays a huge role here too, the principle that people are more sensitive to losses than to gains, suggesting that we tend to do 
do more to avoid losses than to acquire gains. Market timers may realize they can't beat the market, but they still think they can avoid losses by sitting on the sidelines waiting for a crash that may never come. There are several important explicit and implicit costs of trying to time the market that illustrate its suboptimality as an investing strategy on average. The first is fees. Granted, many modern brokers are adopting a fee-free trading model, but if you happen to be with one that still charges commissions on trades, you're incurring one every time you time the market or dollar cost average in, as opposed to a single one up front on a single lump sum buy order. You're also taking on the bid ask spread with each new trade as well. Tiny basis points add up over the long term. This cost is exacerbated in a taxable environment because you may be creating taxable events with your trades. An implicit cost of market timing is your time. If you're trying to predict market movement to buy low and sell high, any extra analysis and subsequent trading you have to do is an implicit opportunity cost where you could have been doing something else. If you spend one hour per week charting and placing buy orders, for example, that's 52 hours per year spent on something that is very likely providing no benefit and is actually hurting your total return over the long term. The most significant cost that I briefly mentioned earlier is missing out on market gains while sitting on cash, which intrinsically makes the investor's asset allocation more conservative. This is again the main reason why lump sum investing beats dollar cost averaging on average. But the point is even more important in this context, as the market timer may be sitting on cash for months or even years in anticipation of a crash. This is the most significant cost for a reason that many new investors don't realize, that the stock market's gains for any given year come from just a handful of days of stellar performance. The graph here from Schwab shows how missing out on just the 10 best days for the S&P 500 from 2001 to 2020 cut your total return in half, and the results go down from there. In investigating the purported merits of market timing, we find yet another example illustrating how passive index investing beats active management on average. And of course, that time in the market beats timing the market indeed. Trying to time the market is usually more harmful than helpful, and missing out on just a handful of days of market gains can have huge ramifications in the form of lower returns. With dollar cost averaging, you would get an objective benefit in the form of greater total return only if the share price of whatever you're buying drops on average over your selected time interval, which lowers your average cost basis. For a hypothetical example, let's suppose your first $1,000 deposit happens when the share price is $100, the second month's investment occurs when the share price is $90, and so on and so forth, until your fifth and final investment of $1,000 happens in the fifth month when the share price is $60. So you've invested $1,000 five times at respective share prices of $100, $90, $80, $70, $70, and $60. Thus, your average cost basis is $80. Had you invested the lump sum all at once on the first day, your cost basis would be $100. This is the type of example you'll see on most blogs discussing dollar cost averaging and praising its use. However, on average, it doesn't work out like this. The simple reason is that, on average, over the long term, the market tends to go up. We're investing in the market precisely because of that fact. So the case is usually the opposite of the hypothetical example earlier. This should be somewhat intuitive. In a nutshell, by dollar cost averaging over those five months, you also risk the market going up over that time and increasing your cost basis, thereby missing out on gains you would have achieved had you invested the full lump sum on day one. Because the market tends to go up, this scenario is statistically more likely. In other words, by employing a dollar cost averaging strategy, we're either Either exposing part of the total sum to losses or to gains. DCA helps during the former, but hurts during the latter, and the latter occurs more often. Thus, it is usually advantageous to get more money in the market as soon as possible. So all things being equal, investing the lump sum all at once should be preferable over dollar cost averaging. We can illustrate the intuitiveness of the suboptimality of dollar cost averaging versus investing
investing a lump sum with a single extreme example. Suppose you receive a windfall of $1 million at 20 years old and want to invest it. Your two choices are to invest the full million dollars all at once or to invest 2% or $20,000 per year over the next 50 years. Hopefully it appears obvious that the latter would be a poor choice because in investing in the market at all, we're intrinsically assuming that it will go up on average in the future. By definition, if you're unwilling to invest a lump sum over a period of 50 years, you shouldn't be willing to do the same over a period of one year. The principle and the math are the same, albeit to a less detrimental degree for the shorter time period. To put some numbers to what we're talking about, Vanguard found in a 2012 study that for rolling 10-year periods in the U.S. from 1926 to 2011, using a 12-month DCA investment period, lump sum portfolios outperformed DCA portfolios 67% or two-thirds of the time. This number was virtually identical for markets outside the United States as well. Plenty of other researchers found the exact same results as early as over 40 years ago, but the recent Vanguard paper put things in concise, easily digestible terms for retail investors. As you might imagine, this also means that the longer you extend the DCA time interval, the worse the results get for the DCA investor in terms of both probabilities and returns. For any given single trading day, the market is slightly more likely to go up than down. For any given month, that probability of the market going up is higher, and for a year, even higher. On average, any uninvested cash sitting idly is missing out on more market gains over a longer time period, and the longer that time period gets, the more likely it is that the market has gone up. In Vanguard's study, increasing the DCA investment period from 12 months to 36 months took the LSI portfolio's winning percentage from 67% to a whopping 90%. In Vanguard's words, on average, an immediate lump sum investment has outperformed systematic implementation strategies across global markets. This conclusion is consistent with finance theory as immediate investment exposes cash to historically upward trending markets for a greater period of time. If an investor chooses to invest systematically, we recommend keeping the time frame to no longer than one year. Vanguard also pointed out in their study that investors may overlook the fact that using DCA and holding cash creates a temporary but significant deviation from one's target asset allocation toward a much more conservative one, creating a different overall exposure to risk. This deviation becomes more impactful in a negative way as the cash balance or the DCA investment period grows. This means that lump sum investing or LSI with a lower risk portfolio like a 60-40 is basically the same as dollar cost averaging into 100% stocks due to holding that cash. I personally wouldn't use a DCA period longer than about three months. Also note that the environment in which DCA shines, a falling stock market, is going to be the hardest time for a risk averse investor for whom DCA is said to be ideal to stay the course with their investing strategy. Another subtle but important point is that in a mean variance framework, DCA usually doesn't even beat LSI on a risk adjusted basis either. Now let's briefly address buy the dip. An important corollary to all this is that you should never hold cash on the sidelines as dry powder to try to time the market, which is called buying the dip, especially since we already know attempting to time the market is usually more harmful than helpful in general, as that cash is missing out on the gains and compounding on average. This buy the dip conversation usually happens when markets reach all time highs, suggesting that one should hold some cash and wait for the market to drop and then buy in. This sounds nice in theory, but reality tells a very different story. The simple fact is that the market hits all time highs quite often, and they're usually not followed by dips, so you're more likely to get stuck just sitting around on cash that keeps piling up. Here's a pretty staggering statistic to illustrate. 24% of months have been record highs for the US stock market historically, and only 1.1 0.14% of those months have been followed by a decline greater than 10% within the 12 months following. Because of this, a buy the dip strategy is even worse than dollar cost averaging. Again, we always want to get any cash in the market as soon as possible. You can extend this to illustrate why you should turn dividend reinvestment on and not hold them as cash, or worse, withdraw them as income. Now let's talk about a few advantages of dollar cost averaging. While we know lump sum investing beats dollar cost averaging on average, DCA has some benefits related to the psychological
psychological and emotional aspects of investing. In averaging out your cost basis over intervals, you are reducing the impact of short-term volatility of the investment. This can be particularly attractive for risk-averse investors. If the investor deposits a total amount in the market on a single day, they may feel uneasy about the prospect of a market crash in the near future. Dollar cost averaging quells this fear. Similarly, the market may indeed drop immediately after the lump sum is invested, in which case the investor will likely feel regret over investing the lump sum all at once. This is known as the principle of loss aversion. Humans are more sensitive to losses than to gains. Dollar cost averaging again remedies this. This is similar to how income investors may prefer chasing dividends for the psychological benefits even though selling shares as needed should be mathematically preferable. Depending on the size of the windfall in question, investing the lump sum all at once may require a high tolerance for risk. It's more of a gamble in that the market can immediately tank or immediately skyrocket. Remember though that on average, this is probably a risk worth taking if you're getting a windfall every year. Mir Statman maintains that rational investors are immune to the emotional influence of pride and the regret on choices, but normal investors are not immune. The purchase or sale of stocks today can result in a possibly large gain or large loss during the coming month, while cash would bring a sure but small gain. If the purchase of shares by normal investors results in gains, these gains are supplemented by the joy of pride. If the purchase of shares results in losses, however, those losses are magnified by the pain of regret. DCA also helps remove the temptation to try to time the market and make trades on emotion, for example, over confidence in expectation of a market upswing. A DCA strategy can thus mitigate the impact of the investor's own biases. This may be a major benefit for novice investors. Unfortunately, the behavioral aspects of investing are very real. While we would objectively prefer lump sum investing on paper, dollar cost averaging offers clear psychological benefits that are perfectly reasonable and even desirable for certain risk-averse investors. So what kind of trade-off are we talking about? Vanguard found that for the rolling 10-year periods and a DCA period of 12 months, the value of the LSI portfolios on average was 2.3% greater than the DCA portfolios. Are the previous psychological benefits worth 2.3% of your portfolio's estimated value at retirement? Vanguard state, even though LSI's average outperformance and risk-adjusted returns have been greater than those of DCA, risk-averse investors may be less concerned about averages than they are about worst-case scenarios, as well as the potential feelings of regret that would occur if a lump sum investment were made immediately prior to a market decline. These concerns are not unreasonable. As with any asset allocation decision, investors must determine for themselves whether or not reducing their portfolio risk in an attempt to avoid losses and regrets is worth reducing the potential for higher returns. Now let's briefly address dollar cost averaging versus regular deposits. The term dollar cost averaging per se unfortunately has led to some disagreement over its precise meaning, largely due to its being discussed in different contexts by different types of investors throughout the years. The vast majority of investors are simply regularly investing from their paychecks every two weeks and never encounter a significant windfall of immediately available cash that they would have to decide how to invest. Technically, this is dollar cost averaging in that you're putting money in the market at regular intervals throughout the year. But there's really no windfall involved for which you have to choose how to time the investment of those dollars. In choosing a percentage of your paycheck to invest, you are not holding some of that investable cash to invest later. In investing circles, the term dollar cost averaging refers to the conscious strategy of taking a lump sum and spreading it out at even intervals to invest. Again, for most investors, this situation will only apply in instances like receiving an annual bonus at work, a tax refund, an inheritance, winning the lottery, etc. So no, you are not using a dollar cost averaging strategy by just investing normally from your paycheck into your 401k. This continuous automatic investing is actually more like lump sum investing because you are investing every cash allocation in full as soon as it becomes available. In conclusion, dollar cost averaging may be a useful behavioral tool, but it won't get you greater returns. DCA may offer for real benefits for risk-averse investors, but those benefits are entirely psychological in nature, and they only work if the investor sticks with the timing strategy through market downturns, which is easier said than done. This 
trade-off of lower returns via a suboptimal timing strategy for these psychological benefits may be perfectly reasonable and desirable for some investors. Investors utilizing DCA should try to keep the time interval as short as their risk tolerance allows, as the results worsen as the time interval increases. On average, if you can stomach it, investing a lump sum all at once should be mathematically preferable to dollar cost averaging, thereby allowing the investor to get more money in the market sooner with a lower cost basis for greater gains over the long term. Similarly, investors should avoid holding cash on the sidelines as dry powder for the purpose of trying to time the market. On average, investing today is better than waiting until tomorrow. Vanguard's conclusion regarding DCA versus LSI was as follows. The prudent action is investing the lump sum immediately to gain exposure to the markets as soon as possible. But if the investor is primarily concerned with minimizing downside risk and potential feelings of regret resulting from lump sum investing immediately before a market downturn, then DCA may be of use. Of course, any emotionally based concern should be weighed carefully against both the lower expected long run returns of cash compared with stocks and bonds and the fact that delaying investment is itself a form of market timing, something few investors succeed at. Many seem to need a sobering reminder of rationality to stay the course and take a long-term view. Sir John Templeton reminded us in 1933 that the four most dangerous words in investing are this time is different. Now is the time when emotions are tested. If you feel the need to abandon ship or change your strategy, then by definition, it did not align with your tolerance for risk in the first place. As risk tolerance is the point at which one is tempted to make such a change based on current market market conditions. Jack Bogle, the father of index investing, admonished investors to stand there and do nothing. I'm making this video in July 2022 when the S&P 500 is down roughly 20% year to date, but the principle is timeless. They may sound platitudinous at this point, but the usual reminders ring true now more than ever. Establish a healthy emergency fund, choose a strategy and asset allocation that fits your personal goals, time horizon, and risk tolerance, diversify broadly, invest early and often, don't try to time the market, and stay the course and ignore the short-term noise. Hopefully now you realize that these are not empty, meaningless phrases that I repeat ad nauseum just for fun. As Bernstein points out, young investors should rejoice over bear markets like these early in their investing horizon because they're able to pick up shares at a lower cost basis while they're on sale. Unless you're at or near retirement, this should be your mindset. In other words, if you have a long time horizon, and are still reliably employed, you should be buying assets just as you normally would with your regular paychecks. No more and no less. The current market turmoil should not change the dollar amounts you are regularly investing. As usual, the best stocks to buy right now and anytime are the 9,116 found in a single global market index fund. That's the current number of holdings in VT, the Vanguard Total World Stock ETF. But should you buy preferred stocks? Probably not. So is Jeppy a good investment? Probably not. Why would we be interested in utilities? Utilities refer to basic regulated public services like water, natural gas, electricity, and sewage. Investing in the utility sector provides long-term investors with stable income from dividends, as well as lower volatility and low correlation relative to the broader stock market. Utilities also tend to perform well during market downturns, as demand for utilities is relatively constant. Consequently, overweighting utilities in one's portfolio may offer a diversification benefit, reducing over all portfolio volatility and risk. For the period 1999 through July 2020, adding a 10% tilt to utilities did precisely that compared to the total stock market, resulting in higher general and risk-adjusted returns with lower volatility and smaller drawdowns. Utilities may even be preferable to REITs and commodities. Utility operating costs are passed to the ratepayer, and using utilities over REITs lets you avoid the idiosyncratic risks associated with real estate markets. Moreover, of all sectors, utilities are the least explained by the known equity risk factors that explain the differences and returns between diversified portfolios. T-bills, short for treasury bills, are just ultra short-term bonds from the U.S. government. These short bonds with maturities of less than a year are called bills. Because they're backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, they possess no liquidity risk, credit risk, or default risk inherent of corporate bonds. As such, t 
T-bills are quite literally the risk-free asset, as they're called. These special, seemingly boring bonds are considered a cash equivalent. At this point, you might be thinking this all automatically means negligible returns from treasury bills, but you'd be wrong. Their annualized historical return from 1928 to 2020 was 3.32%. The average rate of inflation over that period was 3.02%, which means a real return or return adjusted for inflation of 0.3%. T-bills are sold at a discount and don't pay a coupon like most bonds, so they simply return their face value at maturity. The difference between your purchase price and that face value is your interest. Because they're able to be rolled quickly, T-bills are also a decent inflation hedge. T-bills essentially kept pace with inflation during the double-digit inflation of the 1970s in the U.S. T-bills are a great place to park excess cash to be used for near-future liabilities so that you don't lose their purchasing power to inflation. This might sound crazy, but there have also been extended periods where T-bills outperformed the stock market. The 15 years from 1929 to 1943, the 17 years from 1966 to 1982, and the 13 years from 2000 to 2012. Humans have a tendency to latch onto specific people and believe everything they say is true without assessing the content of each piece of information or advice on its own merits. This is known as authority bias. Investors tend to do this with figures like Warren Buffett and Ray Dalio, and Bogleheads specifically do this with the late Jack Bogle. Not everything one person says should be taken as gospel, including things that I say. One could make the argument that Jack Bogle did more for retail investors than anyone else in history. He is one of the most well-known figures in the investing world. He founded the shareholder-owned brokerage firm Vanguard and constantly fought for lower fees and the power of things like passive index investing and diversification. Bogle definitely espoused some fantastic ideas and very quotable pieces of sage advice over the years, and many of his followers, called Bogleheads, adhere to those ideas with an almost cult-like ideological rigidity. But there are several areas where it may be wise to deviate from Bogle's advice. Let's explore them. First is on ETFs. Bogle advocated for index investing by buying and holding a mutual fund. Sounds innocent enough, but when the first ETF, or exchange-traded fund, launched in 1993, he felt the vehicle inherently promoted more trading, and trading is staunchly anti-Boglehead due to higher fees and the folly of market timing. He was also concerned that intraday pricing of ETFs, as opposed to the guaranteed NAV for mutual funds at the close of trading, would always lead to them being sold at a premium to retail investors, and suggested that investors didn't need that intraday liquidity anyway. In short, Bogle felt that ETFs were a poor product and were just a way for exchanges to extract fees from investors. In fairness, Bogle's concerns are valid for investor behavior. They just weren't inherent properties of the ETF as a product as he proposed. In any case, even though his theoretical fears never really became a reality, Bogle never changed his anti-ETF stance, and even felt that Vanguard should have never offered them. Next up is corporate bonds. Bogle famously commented many times that the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index, which most total bond market funds track, overemphasizes treasury bonds. He seemed to prefer corporate bonds and suggested that a fund like Vanguard's BND, which only has about 25% corporate bonds, should contain more of them. Bogle liked corporates for their higher yields compared to treasuries, and that's true. But the reason it's true is also the reason I don't own or suggest owning corporate bonds. They're riskier. I explained in a separate video that corporate bonds are inherently much more correlated with stocks, have greater tax consequences, and tend to fall at the precise times when we need them most. For these reasons, historically, an equities portfolio with treasury bonds generated higher general and risk adjusted returns than one using corporate bonds. This is also why I don't use total bond market funds and prefer to use treasury bond funds. For the investor who owns any allocation to stocks, I see no reason to own corporate bonds. Yield and a greater risk reward profile within fixed income assets should only be concerns if the portfolio for some reason is 100% bonds. Third and last on our list are international stocks. Something I've mentioned many times before is the idea of global diversification. Unfortunately, Bogle's championing of passive index investing stopped at U.S. borders. Bogle famously only invested in the U.S. stock market and didn't feel the need or see the reason to own international stocks. Make no mistake that this is very much an active choice, which is ironic for someone who proposed buying everything.
everything. Bogle had a few explicit reasons for avoiding international stocks. Bogle's first reason for solely sticking with the US is that international investing involves extra risk, ranging from currency risk and economic risk to social instability risk. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. These are the unique risks that we're expecting to be compensated for and that are responsible for lower correlations to US stocks. Secondly, Bogle commented that international stocks move close enough with US stocks that they don't offer much diversification. This is arguably true of developed markets, but is demonstrably false for emerging markets. I've explained elsewhere that emerging markets offer unique risks and a reliably lower correlation to the US market. Any purveyor of market history will know emerging markets have proved a useful component in portfolios over most time periods. The last main component of Bogle's US-centric argument is the assumption that the United States leads the globe in productivity and economic output. Put. Ergo, its stock market will outperform. There are a couple problems with this assumption though. First, GDP and stock market returns have been negatively correlated historically, so the idea is based on a logical fallacy. Similarly, Vogel always noted, as many do, that large US companies get revenue from abroad, but this doesn't really hold any weight either. A stock's market risk component will move with its country's stock market. Secondly, many subscribe to this US-only idea due to recency bias. Zooming out, there are plenty of extended periods historically where international stocks outperformed US stocks and where a global portfolio had higher general and risk-adjusted returns than a US portfolio. In fact, recent US outperformance means lower future expected returns, not higher compared to international markets. The point is that sensible investors must acknowledge that the future is unknowable and invest accordingly, which in my opinion means truly owning everything. This is where the famous VT and chill mantra comes from. So to recap, Jack Bogle was one of the greatest minds in investing, but ETFs are fine, treasury bonds should probably be preferable alongside stocks to corporate bonds, and it's likely wise to invest globally in stocks. Tax loss harvesting, selling losing positions to offset gains and or reduce taxable income may be a useful part of your investing strategy. The tax savings from harvesting losses increase as one's marginal tax rate increases.